The material I'm going to be presenting today is, uh, comprises uh, some of the evidence I gathered in my attempt to answer my own question as to whether it was both, both physically and culturally possible that this supposed uh, effigy of William Shakespeare could have been a copy of an effigy of another man, someone who uh, wasn't British and who probably had never set foot in England. I've been, a practicing gene I've been practicing genealogy for over 40 years, and during that time, I've identified quite a few of my English ancestors, and I've had the pleasure of traveling overseas, online or in person, uh, tramping through cemeteries and visiting churches in many of the shires in which my uh, ancestors lived before they immigrated to colonial Virginia. But I've been an Oxfordian for far less time. And so since I joined the movement six years ago, I've been finding new joy in exploring the genealogy of the Elizabethan nobility and following new pathways in England that my 16th century gentry families never had led me to before. And I find it especially delightful when I come across a route that seems to have been completely ignored by Stratfordians uh, who, from my point of view, seem to have squandered the tools of genealogy uh, by, for centuries by using the wrong names, studying the wrong collateral families, and generally following the wrong maps. Well, today I'm gonna to take you down a side street I entered in a, my typical genealogy-driven fashion that led me to a literal, non-metaphorical map of an 18th century housing development it was built on a plot of land uh, in what was then the outskirts of London by a contemporary power couple, the Countess Henrietta Cavendish Halls and her husband, the second Earl of Oxford and Earl Mortimer Edward Harley. They lived in, in the neighborhood as it grew into what is now central London at a time when the northwestern edge of the city uh, was being converted from open fields. Edward Harley is the same nobleman whose back was depicted here while he was gazing at the Shakespeare Cenotaph in Holy Trinity Church. This sketch was drawn by his traveling partner, the artist, antiquarian, and compulsive note taker, uh, George Virtue, during a tour they took uh, together through Warwickshire this very week in 1737. How about that? Among their reasons for stopping in Stratford-upon-Avon was to engage a craftsman to make a plaster copy of the Shakespeare effigy for Edward Harley. Knowing where people lived and who they lived near is essential to forming a complete genealogical picture of a family's history. And honestly, I didn't know before I came upon this, this picture of, of, of this plat of Harley's neighborhood from 1746 that the area around Cavendish Square in London is a, might hold such unique fascination for Oxfordians. Not only because the community park and most of the nearby streets uh, were named for the 18th century residents of the neighborhood, uh, and one of the names in particular is so well known to us students of authorship. But what surprised me more is that so many of the residents showed in their choice of the art they collected and through their civic volunteerism, such exceptional interest in preserving the memory of Shakespeare. The people who lived here when their housing was new were actively involved in raising public awareness and funding monuments to Shakespeare, like this unassuming figure at Stowe Gardens, sculpted by John Michael Risbach, whose house was just around the corner from the Harleys. And this, the, the famous folding statue at Westminster Abbey, designed by William Kent and sculpted by Peter Schemachers, who both lived a, a, about a half mile south of Cavendish Square. I didn't know that so many of the Shakespeare monument promoters kept townhouses within a half mile of each other because of, and because of class differences. I never imagined them residing so close to the artists they patronized. But I also didn't know that with their common drive to preserve, create, or invent 
a memory of Shakespeare? That so many of them shared a common kinship. Now that I've teased you with a side of a familiar face, I'm not going to linger on this map because first I want to show you the picture that instigated what became the rather long, sorry, winding, very winding research itinerary that circled me back to this place and to the heart of this presentation. These side-by-side -side images that bear remarkable similarity were snipped from a post in an online thread by Monica Steiner in the Shakespeare Facebook page in April of 2016. My first reaction to seeing uh, the photo of the Stratford bus alongside its apparent doppelganger was wry amusement. I did a little, a little checking online and determined that the gray marble figure adjacent to the more colorful one is of Carlo Emanuele Vigiani. Carlo Vigiani practiced canonical law. He became a consistorial advocate and the rector of La Sapienza, the University of Rome, uh, before he died in that city in 1661. His tomb, carved by the sculptor Domenico Guidi, lies in the Chiesa Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. The edifice is a Roman basilica believed to have been built upon the foundation of an ancient temple dedicated to the goddess Minerva. Feeling unsure about how much the similarity or differences between the two carved faces was due to the shots having been taken from different angles, uh, in different lighting, and using different cameras, I electronically snipped a copy of Steiner's post and filed it away so that I'd remember to visit Vigiani's tomb the next time I happened to be in Rome. This past year, however, I was at home in Nashville um, searching online for resources for drama teachers, and I came across this image of Shakespeare, which is one I'd never seen before, so I began to investigate its provenance. The drawing can be traced back to the collected papers of the 19th century English antiquarian, Rodden Brown. In 1833, Brown had traveled to Venice with the goal of finding the grave of the banished Duke of Norfolk, uh, Thomas Mowbray. I noticed that clicked accident. Um, anyway, he happens to be one of my 22nd great-grandfathers. Because I also have English uh, browns in my tree, I sought to compare his roots with mine. But digging further, I was unable to find any kinship with Mowbray and Brown's tree, so, or anyone else in his lineage that matched my own. So his genealogy proved to, me, uh, to be of little interest to me until I discovered that his business partner, chief collaborator, and executor of his will, George Augustus Frederick Cavendish Bintink was a Mowbray descendant and therefore one of my distant cousins. Uh, but then, in uh, studying his pedigree, I learned that George was also a triple De Vere descendant. As you can see outlined there in red, the grandparents on his father's side, the third Duke and Duchess of Portland, were both De Vere descendants. And they both were descended from Oxford's aunt, the Countess Frances De Vere Howard. On Bentick's maternal side, his mother, Mary Lowther, uh, there in the box in pink, uh, she, ah, this is forwarding my things. To, oh, sorry, I'm going ahead and I don't want to. Um, anyway, so George had three big splashes. Is that back? There he goes. George had three big splashes from the De Vere gene pool. And he had a special interest in both Venice and Shakespeare. Hmm. So according to George Cavendish Bentick, his partner, Rodden Brown, who was by then a director of the Venetian archives, had sketched the pencil drawing of Shakespeare himself, copying from an old painting on wood that Brown had come across somewhere in Venice uh, once he decided to reside in Italy permanently and had taken up housing in a canal, a palazzo, uh, that had been occupied in the early 17th century by the British ambassador and art collector, Sir Henry Wooden. There's also this inscription in Brown's hand on the back of the pencil sketch, assumed to have been a copy of a notation he'd seen on the original painting. If you didn't know or hadn't guessed, Gotti Lanza means Shakespeare in Italian. And that's an interesting date, isn't it? Hmm, yeah. So, in 1864, the painting after which Brown's drawing had been made surfaced over 500 miles from Venice, having been found neglected like a romance story in a cluttered Parisian shop where it was rescued by the renowned English print seller, Henry Graves. 
The painting is now called The Venice Portrait, and it's owned by the Royal Shakespeare Society. In 1969, the RSS permitted it to be x-rayed, and it was determined that the face of the picture is actually a crafty decoupage. It's made of a cutout of an, one unidentified painting that had been glued on top of the torso of another unidentified painting. Have, having been reading online from George Virtue's collection of notebooks around the same time I learned about the Venice portrait, I recalled that George Virtue had described a similar treatment of a portrait to Shakespeare that he'd seen in a collection of paintings being sold sometime around 1740 in Northamptonshire by the estate of Lord Halifax, George Montague. Well, whether or not the two pictures, the Venice portrait and the Halifax one that seems to have been lost, if they actually were one and the same, really for me, it was the knowledge of that switcheroo, that unkind cutting action, that brought me again to thinking about these two guys. Since someone, apparently, with Shakespeare on their mind had been willing to mutilate one portrait in order to doctor another in the late 17th or early 18th century, I wondered if it was possible that a copy of a sculpted head of an Italian attorney who died in 1661 could have been shipped overseas to be stuck onto a decapitated bust in the English Midlands. Or is that really as ludicrous and improbable as it sounds? In 1904, the great Stratfordian uh, Charlotte Carmichael Stopes, who we're going back to us, uh, published evidence of changes to the Shakespeare effigy and included some contemporary reactions, questioning the results of some of the repaintings of the bust and of the refurbishing attempt, uh, projects that the entire monument had undergone. And we, and we know from this um, newer academic studies, such as this 2005 paper by Richard Whalen of the Oberon Society, currently available for reading on the SOF website. Do check it out. Uh, we know from the appearance that the Shakespeare bust, uh, of the Shakespeare bust in the Holy Trinity Church was perceived by eyewitnesses and appears to us in the pictorial record to have changed at least a bit from time to time. And we know from the correspondence of the Reverend Joseph Green, the Stratford upon Avon schoolmaster, that the bust was taken down at other times too in the 18th century, not only by the copy maker employed by Edward Harley in 1737, but even after the rebeautification work on it had been completed under Green's uh, direction in 1746. For at least the next 150 years, in fact, the bust apparently was taken down in order for plaster copies to be made by nearly anyone who expressed the desire to do so. But even though there is evidence that the figure had been moved and copied several times, the act of replacing its head, the swapping of one entire balding pate with one that had been made to memorialize someone else, that hasn't been seri seriously addressed by anyone as far as I know. And because of that, I thought, maybe I was entering really dumb question territory. Uh, so I spoke with a couple of sculptors about it. Did you know that when we see limbless and headless statues in museums, it isn't because the stone had somehow weathered and cracked and broken naturally without any human assistance? Nearly every ancient statue we see missing one of its sturdier parts got that way through deliberate action. And did you know that when we see figurative sculptures, that figurative sculptures often were designed with removable heads specifically for the ease of altering their appearance? Apparently, oops, apparently in the Roman world for centuries, changing heads on statues was a conventional thing to do. According to Italian historians regarding the alteration of antique Roman effigies, it was no unusual flattery to remove the heads of past tyrants and to replace them with a portrait of the reigning emperor. <laughs> 
or in private families by removing a head, a fresh new picture of their loved one could be made. Sort of like a pre-digital two-for-one special at your local photomat. If a copy of a head or of an entire statue is desired, stone images could be duplicated too, using molten bronze or, or, or plaster or cement made of ground marble. For at least 6,000 years before the time that Edward Harley was ordering the Shakespeare bust copy, there was a commonly used lost wax casting technique for duplicating original sculptures. This process required coating the original with softened wax that was cooled until it hardened. Clay was then smeared over the wax layer and dried to reinforce it. The last mold created in the copying process uh, was formed of plaster that was then fired to increase its sturdiness and reusability and for that heat uh, to allow the wax to liquefy and drip away. Any number of copies of a single work quickly could be replicated with the use and reuse of a plaster mold, just like this one. The custom of duplicating statues and, or, or changing the appearance of any of their parts meant there were lots of discarded ancient cast-offs to be found and lots of reusable molds around too. Accordingly, well before Vigiani's death, there were wealthy English travelers who made it their habit to scour Italy uh, for such antiquities and then to ship them back home for display in the rooms and gardens of their private manors. The most famous of these traveling collectors was Francis Devere Howard's great-grandson, the 21st Earl of Arundel, Thomas Howard. He is known to this day as the Collector Earl, and with the help of his sons and his grandsons, during several tours of Europe, they gathered a prodigious quantity of marble statues. And at least 200 of those were sculptures of human heads. The 21st uh, Earl of Arundel was a patron of artists, including the architect and mask designer, Inigo Jones. He also had toured Prague and Vienna with the Bohemian engraver, Wenceslas Hollar, bringing that artist back to England to live as his guest in his household for several years. And he was acquainted with the sculptor, uh, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, who would oversee the creation of Carlo Vigiani's tomb. Arundel had commissioned Bernini in the early part of the artist's career to carve a bas-relief of one of his five infant grandchildren uh, in the arms of his heir, <coughs> Henry Frederick. <coughs> the, wife, the wife and mother of Henry Frederick's Howard's 12 children was Elizabeth Stewart. She was the daughter of Esme Stewart, the first Duke of Richmond, third Duke of Lennox. Her father was also sometimes known as the patron and landlord of the playwright Ben Johnson. When the collector Earl uh, died in 1646, his widow, Countess Alethea, inherited all of the Greco-Roman statuary, now referred to as the Arundel Marbles. She kept some of the statues herself and sold some of the others to the Catholic Lord Lemster, William Firmer. But most of the Arundel marble heads were given to her brother-in-law, the first folio dedicatee, William Herbert, third Earl of Pembroke. And then those were passed down by him to his great nephew, the marble heir, Thomas Herbert, eighth Earl of Pembroke, was a grandson of Susan Devere and her husband, Philip Herbert, by their son, Philip Jr. Thomas, the headmaster, as I like to call him, eventually added to his inherited collection 52 additional heads he'd acquired through his own European travels. And in a manner that bordered on obsession, he endeavored to record the identity of each marble effigy by scratching what he determined to be their names directly into the stone, sometimes in Latin, and sometimes in what was recorded as extremely questionable Greek. Just like his great grandpa! <laughs> oh my. Unfortunately, <clears throat> during Thomas Herbert's ownership, the pedestals, bases, and busts were so altered and switched around that from the modern archivist's perspective, there could be no real certainty today as to the source of every piece the true name of the person figure or its original context. <clears throat>
So the archivists are re reluctant to do, give any identity to them. Although I haven't yet fully investigated whether Carlo Vigiani, oh, this is really bugging me, sorry. I knew this wasn't gonna work for me. Although I uh, haven't fully investigated whether Carlo Vigiani ever crossed paths during his lifetime with any of the aforementioned Howards or Stuarts when they lived in Rome. I can report, however, that a decade after his death, at least one of the Howards was never very far away from Vigiani's tomb. Henry Frederick and Elizabeth Stewart's son, Philip Howard, uh, who could have been the baby in the Bernini bas relief, had entered Roman, uh, the Roman Catholic priesthood at Cremona, Italy in uh, 1652. He had spent the next two decades away ministering in the Low Countries before returning to Italy and earning the title of cardinal in 1675. And then in 1679, he assumed his official capacity as titular head of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. Let me make this crystal clear, if it isn't already. The chief administrator of the church in which this guy's tomb was built wasn't named Benedetti Ravatta Bianchi. His surname was, he was an English Catholic, the surname of Howard, descended from a family that had suffered heavily under Elizabeth over questions of power and faith, and then who became unflagging supporters of the Stuart cause during the English Restoration. And although I've yet found any evidence that Cardinal Philip ever made special note of the carved head of Vigiani when contemplating all of the other colorful sculpture in his home church, I can tell you that in Vigiani's lifetime, he had been well known internationally for two significant achievements, either of which would have prolonged his fame well after his death, at least for Cardinal Philip and his Catholic and Stuart relatives. The most notorious uh, Vigiani's undertaking had been the legal representation he provided on behalf of Charles IV, Duke of Lorraine, who was a polarizing figure in the ongoing international Catholic versus Protestant divide. In 1652, the Duke had entered into a messy marriage annulment suit in Roman consistory court against his wife, Nicole of Lorraine. Uh, she was also known as his cousin. Oh, and she was also known as his aunt, too. Uh, the, the, case, uh, the case was not only controversial, but lurid, because the Duke was already living in what some leaders in the, in the church regarded as unlawful marriage with another woman. Despite being a bigamist in the eyes of his church, the Duke was highly devoted to his religion to the point of zealotry. For that reason, he was a prominent supporter of Catholic sovereignty over all of the British Isles. Toward the end of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, he offered to take a placeholding role for a future unnamed Catholic Stuart monarch by serving as Lord Protector of Ireland during the Interregnum. In addition to his defense of the Duke of Lorraine, Carlo Vigiani's other notable lifetime achievement was that he'd authored this book on Cicero's Latin translation of Greek philosophy. We know, we know this book made it to England. Uh, a copy of the work was listed in the first formal index of the holdings of the Harleian Library in 1743. The Harleian had originated from the personal library of the noted Jacobite and, and collector, Edward Harley's father, the first Earl of Oxford and Earl Mortimer, Robert Harley. The elder Harley was born in post-Commonwealth England in the same year Vigiani died, and the same year that Oliver Cromwell died, a second death, in a bizarre posthumous punishment ordered by the restored Stuart King, Charles II. Uh, if any of you aren't familiar with the story, uh, Cromwell's dead body was disinterred, propped up to stand trial in front of a jury, found guilty, and subjected to execution by hanging. His, his decapitated skull was then kebobbed onto a spike that was raised above Westminster Hall. His skull loomed over London for two decades, over two decades, a silent witness to the giddy rebound that erupted in the streets below once everyone was certain that old Oliver was really, really dead, and the drab Cromwellian era restraints could be lifted at last on dress, music, dancing, theater, and the arts, and the far more libertine Stuart sensibilities could flourish. A group of young nobles led by this Devere descendant became the poster children for the new comportment norms of the time, known as the Merry Gang, 
they bonded together in raucous public gatherings for no other apparent purpose than to uh, for to compete with each other in their sartorial displays, uh, to drink, match wits, <clears throat> womanize, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Get either the punchline, too. Brawl, and pull outrageous pranks. Some of their fabled feats were impersonating physicians, particularly with women, uh, simulating, uh, uh, let's see, simulating sex in public, particularly with each other, breaking into churches to urinate on communion tables. And one episode, and I don't know why that's there, one episode where a rare and priceless sundial uh, was destroyed with their swords. And the picture didn't show up. Huh. No, I never looked over there. There should be a picture of it. Oh, did I get ahead of myself? That's possible. This is, just keeps jumping on me. Although the, although the Mary Gang uh, had retired, that's right, there's the Mary Gang. Is that them? No. Um, was retired uh, by the time of the Popish Plot and Glorious Revolution of 1688. New collectives of younger uh, inebriated noblemen followed their antique footsteps and assembled and became these hellfire clubs. Uh, by the early 16th century, the members of the club did begin tempering their behavior, uh, at least some of the time, uh, by mingling their debauchery, we should say, with a civic dedication to reviving the theater, funding the design and construction of public buildings, and working to install neoclassical art and architecture on the grounds of their estates. One of the most prominent of these 18th century uh, rakish philanthropic groups, the Society of Dilettanti, that club actually required it would, its would-be members visit Italy in order to better educate themselves about classical culture and to search for more antiquities to bring back to England. The motto of the Society of Dilettanti was French. S'il vous plaît, Catherine. Ah, merci. In English, that means do what thou wilt. And one of the club's founders, Baron Le Desponce Francis Dashwood, enthusiastically lived up to it. And his famous, most famous feat was to have impersonated the king of Sweden during a trip he took to Russia, and in that guise to have asked the czar for his daughter's hand in marriage. So, oh, I went backwards again. Yeah, no, I didn't. Okay, so during a period of time, this is what I've been trying to create for you, this time period that we don't always study so much. This was a period of time when the population of England's exceeded five million. It had really grown after the, all the plague and everything. This was when the scions of the wealthiest English families were overseas gathering up Roman antiquities hand over fist, trying to outdo each other in the competing chaos of rebuilding their country while regularly committing acts of alcohol-induced public mayhem. It seems to me that a head, oh, being unceremoniously removed from an inanimate object and then being swapped for another, are, although unfamiliar to our modern sensibilities, that act, if it happened, could not have aroused more than idle curiosity by anyone outside the titled circle of socialites who had the means and opportunities to do the deed. And that takes us back to the environs of this 18th century subdivision, the crossroads of the many art patrons active during the time that the Shakespeare monument in Stratford-upon-Avon was undergoing its first recorded rehabilitation. This square mile, burbling with many of the most civic-minded Londoners, known for their ability to have used their social standing and financial clout to exercise influence over the public perception of the enigmatic author of the Shakespeare canon. How far might any of them have gone to shape his physical image to their liking? Here they are lined up, guilt by association, mingled with their like-minded allies and comprising about 5% of the British peerage in the early 18th century. All of them prominent art aficionados, next to the artists they patronize that are recognized for having designed or produced in stone or paint or ink portraits of Shakespeare and are canonically Shakespearean art, like this statue by Riesbrock I showed you earlier 
carved to sit in the exedra called the Temple of British Worthies that was designed by a man whose family were longtime stewards of the Earls of Pembroke. We know from the letters of the Parson Joseph Green that some marble from the Shakespeare Cenotaph in, in Holy Trinity was used in building that exedra at Stowe Gardens. Stone parts that had broken off at least a decade before the 1746 beautification project somehow had ended up in the construction pile. So the first subgroup of potential head swapping perps I've, um, I'm highlighting here in red were heirs to parts of the Arundel Marble Collection. My thinking is that from mishandling by the plaster copy makers or during the periodic remodeling of Holy Trinity or from various extreme weather effects, it's conceivable that the original effigy itself might have been damaged or even broken to the extent that it may have needed to be replaced. Or um, from their, and, and these nobles, from their enormous collection of carved stone, could have provided suitable substitutes or pieces to serve as models uh, for the broken one. The men I've singled out in this lineup were self-identified Freemasons. They could speak the language of stone, and they practiced secrecy, too. Any one of them could have been involved in the decision to carve Masonic symbols on the Westminster Monument. And only they and their fraternal brotherhood would have been privy to what else might have been done in secret to a statue from a century before that already had a share of my Masonic iconography. Thomas Pelham Halls, Duke of Newcastle, for example, was a Freemason, and his overriding interest in theater was pretty much a job requirement uh, since he was Lord Chamberlain, and he acted as official censor of theatrical content. Coincidentally, he was inducted into his Freemason Lodge, which also was in that half mile that I've been showing you, um, on the same day, he was inducted the same day as was Francis Stephen, the new Duke of Lorraine, who was later crowned Holy Roman Emperor in 1745. And 1745 was a pivotal year for English history, too. It marked the beginning of the feudal last attempt by the Stuarts to retake the British monarchy. Because the timing of the Jacobites' last rally for the throne coincided with the restoration work being done on the Shakespeare Memorial in Holy Trinity, perhaps as a silent battle cry, or in retaliation for the terrible slaughter of their forces in 1746 at Culloden Moor. These noblemen, whose recent ancestors and living relatives were Catholic and or uh, Jacobite sympathizers, they may have been inclined to carry out a quiet, subversive action against a mouthpiece of Tudor Protestantism. These 18th century art patrons practiced a different sort of religion, and that was bardolatry. Having possibly the most altruistic mo uh, motives of them all, they could have gone, uh, gone above and beyond merely cleaning and touching up little defects in the Stratford bust uh, because of their great love and admiration for the work of William Shakespeare. Uh, one of the chief fundraisers in commissioning the Westminster Monument to the Bard, the Countess of Shaftesbury, Susan Ashley Cooper, uh, she became involved in the endeavor through her work as co-founder of the Shakespeare Ladies Club. The club was dedicated to improving the cultural merit of London theater by encouraging producers uh, to put up respectable versions of Shakespeare instead of the body uh, restoration era affair. Lastly, on the far, far other side of the motivation spectrum, if my theoretical swap had been made, indeed, perhaps the action could have just boiled down to impulse control issues. All of these men highlighted were known to have been spectacular rakes. And Francis Dashwood wasn't the only 18th uh, century De Vere descendant famous for his crazy escapades. In fact, my cousin, William Bentick, second Duke of Portland, and his pal, Philip Dormer Stanhope, fourth Earl of Chesterfield, whose third great-grandmother was Susan De Vere Herbert, these two noblemen instigated at, at what has become called the greatest hoax ever. If you'd like to Google it, it's been dubbed uh, the, great, the Great Bottle Conjurer Hoax, and it's sometimes uh, offered as a perfect example of the danger of unmonitored curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'd like to see a show of hands here. Whoops. How many of you know you're descended from Charlemagne? There, notice there was always someone descended from Charlemagne, right? How many of you know that you're descended from someone else who was famous in history about at least 150 years ago? Yeah. Now, think about you, why you know that and why it matters to you. And I'm going to show you all the people I've been considering for possible involvement in Shakespeare head swapping who were related by blood or marriage to the 17th Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere. Whatever hijinks they may or may not have done, these are the people whose motives we need to know more about, regardless of the dangers of our unmonitored curiosity. Instead of retracing our steps within the confines of the Elizabethan and Jacobian eras, what else can we learn from these 18th century pedigreed de Vere descendants, uh, the small subset of some of the wealthiest English families, unique for their demonstrable interest in Shakespeare, these great amassers of personal libraries and art, these patrons of artists and sculptors and designers like Rubiak, Virtue, Gibbs, Riesbrock, Schemachers, and Kent, names synonymous with Shakespeare imagery. I believe there's a lot more to pin down about the motivations and actions of these patrons of Shakespeare memorialization, and particularly the Harleian contingent that built the Cavendish Square neighborhood. I have more detailed information on these people and some others of interest I didn't incorporate into this talk, all Devere Kinsmen, it's over there in that fourth grade project I made with my toenail scissors. Um, you can study those select genealogies at your leisure on this display I, ma I made, and if you'd like a copy uh, of, the, of the charts, just email me uh, with Devere Trees in the subject line. Thanks. Thank you.